uh, it gives me tremendous pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Shadrach Frimpong. So he was a sapling and came through this program uh, in 2012, eight years ago. Um, he originally hails from Ghana and his family is from rural Ghana and his, uh, his family were uh, cocoa farmers. So those chocolate bars that you like to eat are in part due to his family. Um, and he came to MSAP and ended up going to the University of Pennsylvania and thought he would just take a crack uh, at uh, applying for a prize from the president of the university. And where he came from, I guess maybe you'll talk about this a little bit, Chadrick. Uh, where he came from, it was very hard to get medical attention. You had to go very long distances to see a doctor. And it was also the custom um, when Shadrach was growing up that girls were not educated, only boys were. And so Shadrach wrote in his uh, proposal that he wanted to go back to Ghana and start a school for girls and a clinic, a health clinic. And he won the prize and he went back there and he built these things. Um, this got attention from a lot of people. It got attention from um, the heads of state, uh, first local communities and then national. Um, and he started a, a charity called Coco 360. And uh, maybe you can talk about this a little bit, Shadrach, but he's now garnered the attention of leaders from countries from around the area who've been so impressed with what he's done, they wanted to talk to him about creating an economic model um, in their countries. He also got the attention of Kofi Annan, um, Secretary General of the UN, who he's uh, spent time talking to. He got the attention of the Queen of England and is a recipient of the Queen's Young Leader Award. He's also a recipient of the Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Award, which has a remarkable list of recipients to it. He's been named Forbes Magazine 30 Under 30 for Global Entrepreneurs in 2019. And he has taken a pause from running this charity to go get a PhD in public health. And he's going to the University of Cambridge where he just won the uh, Gates Cambridge Scholarship, a very prestigious award for getting his PhD at the University of Cambridge. Um, he has uh, been a, he, 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 I used to say he was becoming a global leader. He is now a global leader and has always been a friend. He's also modest. He's also a good friend of, of uh, MSAP. And all right, I'll stop there, Shadrach, and let you talk now. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really humbled. Uh, just, uh, you know, how this whole journey has turned out. I still remember walking through the doors of uh, MSAP as a really scared little kid. I, I was very, very uh, scared at the time. Um, and I think, you know, for me at that age, also coming from an impoverished background and being at a place like Penn, where, you know, most of my classmates are coming from, you know, really private, expensive high schools. I remember my class, my roommate was actually uh, an alum of uh, Philip Andover, and he would talk about their classroom structures and everything. And I'm so confused because I attended schools with mud buildings. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so walking through the doors of, um, you know, Monell, meeting people like, you know, Jen, um, yourself, uh, Dr. Margolski, um, and most importantly, my mentor, Dr. Hakan, it, it changed my life. I, you know, that summer, I had a little journal that you know, I still always refer to, and I, I took a lot of notes. Um, but I owe a lot of who I am to you know, Monel, and that's why regardless of the conditions, I, I, when I got the email from Dr. Hakan, I said, well, if it's Monel, it's happening. You know? <laughs> I was turning down a lot of, uh, speaking engagement, but I was like, no, Manoli has to happen. Even if I have to get on top of the mountain and then like where I am now, make the call, however be, it has to happen. And I've been on the team, our team since uh, two days ago to try and go get internet access from the city so I'm able to do this. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate the honor and really thank, 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 thank uh, you all of you at uh, all the scientists and the mentors at Monel. Um, being where I am now and then being able to look back and see where, you know, um, 
these young scientists are in the program, I can't tell you how much of an impact you are making in their lives. It may not seem clear, it may not seem so visible, and you may think it's only the sciences, but trust me, <laughs> they're, they're the uh, unspeakable and the salient things that we pick up other than you know, the pipetting and then spending time in the hood. I loved those, but I particularly love the real life lessons that I learned from Dr. Hakan. Um, so thank you again, uh, Paul. So like Paul shared, I spent, you know, my, I, I spent the, my very first working experience ever in the US um, in, uh, in the Monell program. I was with Dr. Hakan. And, you know, I did research on, you know, culture and human fungiform uh, popularity cells. And it was, it was really awesome. And I remember my, so my, the, the, the student, the postdoc who was actually, who actually helped me, it's called, uh, right now he's Dr. Bilal, because he's, you know, he's a physician now. Um, but, you know, he was preparing to go to med school and he was also a really, you know, wonderful person. But that summer at Monell, you know, built my confidence so much that after that, you know, I could take the experience I had done to really go to Penn to continue to do research. So, Right after the summer research experience at the end of my uh, freshman year in college, got to Penn and did research on HIV cells. And it was really incredible. We did a lot of incredible work in the lab to the point that after my, right after my sophomore year, there was this researcher at uh, Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Luzon called Didier Trono, who actually invited me and paid for me to, uh, fly all the way from the US to Switzerland to work with him for the following summer. And, and so you can see how much of an impact and of a foundation that uh, the skills at Monell did for me. Most importantly, being able to pay attention to detail and being extremely disciplined. Um, so that really helped and that has gone a long way in my life. So I went to Penn and then, you know, uh, by the grace of God in my senior year when I graduated, was very fortunate to get the President's Engagement Prize. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Breslin shared, I took the funds and we went back home to Ghana. And so um, we're a total of eight siblings, two boys, six girls. And when I was growing up, one of my biggest challenges was that I kept asking my parents, why is it that my, my three older sisters, why don't they have any education? And I look around and, you know, all the young women in the community, nobody's like, you know, going to school. What particularly bothered me beyond my three older sisters was that when I was in elementary school in the community, I always placed at best second or third position. We were ranked. Now, the person who always placed first was a woman. She was extremely, she still is, because I don't think intelligence ever goes away. But when we were in class, no matter how hard I worked, man, I could put together all the lanterns and the candles and try to, because we, you know, I grew up without running water and electricity. My community had electricity in 2005. So my parents always, you know, lit the lantern and then, you know, <laughs> my brother and my siblings would struggle around it to study. But no matter how hard I did try, it just didn't work. This lady would, you know, talk me all the time. She always plays first. And what bothered me was that along the line, her parents pulled her out of school. You know, when I got a scholarship to, you know, leave from the village to go to uh, uh, the city for high school, I, I asked my parents and they said, well, you know, in this village, the most a young girl can go is at the end of uh, grade seven and then that's it, end of story. It really broke my heart and I still, to date, I still think of what, she could have been, you know? I mean, I'm here. I was the guy who was placing second and I'm having Gates Cambridge Scholarship, going to Penn, high GPA, all these high honors. What, what could she have been? And so that really stuck with me. And for me, when I was graduating from Penn, while I had the opportunity to go straight to med medical school, when I got the award, it was a real moment of moral decision-making for me. It was. It was tough whether to stay in the U.S. and continue to you know, go to medical school directly or whether to take the, and turn down the funds or whether to take the funds and then 
you know, just proceed. But obviously, ultimately, the decision I made was because I, I, I didn't want to live with guilt. So <laughs> I was trying to minimize my guilt. So we took the funds and we went home. And, you know, by the grace of God now, you know, we, we, we ended up building an all-girls tuition free school, now has 290 students, all girls. And one of my biggest pride is that the students, the young lady who was topping me at the time, she has three daughters and all of them are in the school. So it gives me great joy uh, to some extent knowing that she, if she couldn't, at least her daughters are there. She's working in the school as well as a kindergarten support teacher. Um, so that was really what drove me in the direction. And you know what Paul shared, you know, health access was about, it's about seven hours away from the community. When I was a kid, my legs were nearly amputated because, well, that beyond the distance is also poverty. So we try to address that by, you know, having the health facility. But I think in all of it, what is really unique in what we've been able to do is that we have an, an all-girls tuition free school. We have a community health facility. And these facilities are self-sustained by the community's own resources from cocoa. Like Paul shared earlier, cocoa is what gives us our chocolate, hot chocolate and all the wonderful things we all love. And so we thought if cocoa gives that much to the global economy, then it's no, it's pretty an injustice that, you know, the people who produce it are that poor. Um, so that's what we did. And now, we, you know, a lot of papers obviously have been published um, around the model that we've done. And, you know, we, last year we submitted the model and the work that we do as actually um, a case study for, a case study for um, a book chapter on social entrepreneurship and, you know, public health schools across the U.S. So now students in public health schools actually study it um, as a case in question. And what I find fascinating is that that mindset of being curious, asking why, because when I worked with Dr. Hakan, that's one of the things Dr. Hakan taught, taught me. Never accept anything at face value. Everything. Like when I went to Penn, my, my professors thought I was nuts. Because if you tell me, well, the villains, uh, the villains uh, you know what, chlorine has a villains electron of uh, what, seven? Or chlorine has a villains electron of one? whatever it is, I know it has a charge of negative one. But I, and so that means what? The valence electron is actually, uh, how many valence electrons? Um, seven, that's correct. It gained one. So, but if you, if, if you tell me chlorine has a valence electron of seven, like I'm gonna ask why. After you ask, answer why, I'm gonna ask you why. <laughs> and my professors hated that. Some hated that, but obviously a lot of them loved it. But that lesson from Dr. Hakan is still something that stuck with me and really obviously ended up with me being able to come up with that model that we have, right? I kept asking why, why, why? Because what we saw is that people go to Africa, they start nonprofits and people on the global, in the global South, you know, in the US and other parts of the world have to keep donating money perpetually to support. But I thought, well, yes, people should support each other. But then these people grow cocoa. They should be able to support themselves too. <laughs> um, and that's what we came up with. They work on their own farm and then they use a bunch of the revenue uh, to support um, the school's expenses. And so that's the model we've been able to come up with. Now, 100% of all non-tuition expenses at our school are 100% funded by the community members themselves. Um, and then at a medical facility, all user fees, what I believe in the US will call copay, they're all funded by the community members themselves too. And that's, you can imagine how such a model is really critical in times of uh, the current pandemic, right? So that's what we've been able to come up with. And obviously, you know, along the way has come up with, you know, has come with many uh, honors and opportunities to be able to represent the team. I don't do this work alone. So when I go for these uh, honors, Sometimes there's a part of me that feels bad because, you know, there, there are a lot of people that are crossing. We have to cross rivers, walk through forests to reach students. Um, and it's always hard uh, for our staff members. So when I get awards, sometimes there's a part of me that feels like, well, is it possible for all of us to get into the flight and go? Um, so I'm really honored for what, you know, our team collectively we've been able to do, you know, the, the, 
and the attention we've gotten from you know President Bill Clinton, uh, Chelsea Clinton, the Clinton Foundation, um, rec most recently the Gates Foundation, and um, you know the, the the Queen's Commonwealth Trust. I still remember meeting the Queen herself. It, it was a surreal experience, you know, just to go from this scared kick, scared kid, <laughs> to to that level. Um, it's been quite a journey, but I guess you know all of those experiences have taught me two important lessons that I would just want to you know, quickly just share with all of you. I've gone through the, 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 the studies that all of you are doing. You know, some of you are working on uh, computational genomics. There are some of you that are working on you know, uh, fruit flies and how they taste, and you know, some working on you know, the, the, the factors behind you know, the saltiness of uh, taste. And, just a really incredible topics, you know, and we just, you know, heard from Saraswati talking about, you know, evolution in taste receptor genes. And when I look at all the incredible work you guys are, you know, working on, and I think back to my experience, I guess, you know, one of the, the first thing I'll tell all of you is just be patient. Um, and obviously something you're probably, you're probably picking up in your research experience, right? It takes a bit of a while to get the data that you want. You get it right, then you get it wrong, and repeat, rinse, repeat. It's so frustrating. But then you find out that in real life, many things are exactly like that, right? And this is especially important because we are, the, we are a generation, I know that many of the PIs here will probably agree because they probably see our generation and sometimes they're a bit worried. Our generation doesn't know what it is to, to relax a little bit, you know? <laughs> we, we, we just, we are always moving. We are so impatient. What's next? What's next? We, we are not that thoughtful as they are. And that's something, it took me a bit of a while to, you know, learn. I remember when I, when I won the award and I went to Ghana, my brain was only functioning on medical school. I'm like, no, man, I have to hurry up and get the hell out of here. It, why? Because it was hard, you know. Here, there are really horrible, you know, internet conditions. If I want to make a phone call, I have to go and stand on a hill and climb trees and all of that. So I thought, wait, I just can't wait to get out of here and get back to the U.S. and be making a lot of money like all my classmates are doing, or at least just be in school. <laughs> um, but patience is a very important thing, and you are learning it in your research, and then you will find out that in real life, you have to be patient. So that's the, the thing. The other piece of the puzzle, why patience is really, really important is also that you, you find out that if you really want to do incredible stuff, you know, then patience is inevitable. Like, I don't know how to put it. Now it's very clear to me. But if you want to do, you know, just run of the mill what everyone is doing, then great, right? You know, uh, you're going to, you know, if you, if you, if you, my mentor here at Yale always tells me, says, well, Shadrach, if you had gone to med school right away, well, you'll be a med school student probably by now searching what research questions you should be pursuing as a scientist. But how awesome is it that you get to pursue research questions that drive meaningful work directly? Like the biomedical research I do now, uh, genius in being patient. It may seem like, you know, right now, things may be hard, your friends may, may, may be moving on and all of that, but really just be patient. And you'll find that the slowest path is actually the fastest path. Um, so for me, it gives me a lot of great joy, you know, go to Cambridge. While the Cambridge PhD is typically, you know, three to four years, but then they said, well, because you're already coming in with your own topic, you guys have done a lot of work. When you come to Cambridge, we don't need you to spend that long just be here for only two years, right? It's, it's just all amazing how everything works out. So that's the first thing I'll share with you. Patience is really important. The second thing is be hard on yourself. This is very contrary and advice to what we were told, at least I was told, and that what our generation is now being told. So first thing, I'm telling you to be patient, but second thing, be hard on yourself. You know, we are told, don't, 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 don't be too hard on yourself. Take it easy. All of that, I get it. But I think that, you know, people look at me and they ask me, how is it that 
you are able to scale, dial back, and at the same time, when you're doing something, while you're working with people and you're patient with everybody as with yourself, you also want to make sure that everyone is giving their very, very best. Why is that? It's something I learned from Dr. Hakan. It was, you know, I remember like during the summer, sometime he would, I remember one, one time I was not finishing a step, uh, we were getting closer to presentation and there was still a part of my research that I had not done yet. And I told him and he said, well, great, you're not done. There are 24 hours in the day. The lab is always open. You can come back anytime. If it's 2 a.m., come back and do it. <laughs> and I was like, 2 a.m.? <laughs> He's like, yes, <laughs> this is real life. If they call you at 2 a.m. that your mother is sick, will you be sleeping or will you wake up? I said, I'll wake up. And he's like, yes. So you do what you need to do. And I'll never forget that because I, I didn't think like that. And it's something that has stuck with me. Being hard on yourself means that you have to be your own ruler. Like you have to be your own point of measurement, right? It, it would mean, yes, you'd be making a lot of mistakes, but you should be striving for excellence. Perfectionism is not possible. Nobody can achieve perfection. But when you're hard on yourself, you push yourself to get the very, very best of everything that you do because our world needs it. And I, I still struggle with the notion in our generation that, you know, take it too easy, you know, average, what I, another thing that bothers me is that we celebrate average too much, you know? We celebrate, we celebrate average. There's just, you know, somebody gets um, a test score and it's in the average percentile. We tell them, this is so wonderful. You have done so well. No, at our school, at, at the girls' school, if a student performs average, we look at them and we tell them, well, this is a good starting point. You just started. This is a good starting point. You're not there yet, but you have to get there. We're going to work with you to get there. Because if, when you, as a student, were applying to get in, so every year our school accepts 30 students from eight communities. We have close to about 500 students apply, and we pick the top 30. This is the, <laughs> so you get picked out of 500 students, you are not going to come there and be giving us an average performance. We will not allow that to happen. And so, because you have to be your very best to go back, the goal is that at some point, you also go back to the, your community and re report that change. So we have that mindset and we are, all, we are all so much capable of so much more. And I, I find that in our generation, what society wants to keep doing to us is, you know, keep pushing all of us down. The more we are told to be, you know, take it easy, take it easy. Then, you know, when you, you work and then you get a 60%, I guess it's fine. It's not fine. From now on, all of you, everything you do and everybody's 100% is different. But one thing I can tell all of you is you're much more capable than you think you actually are. And when you're working, one of my mantra is this, when I'm working and my brain gets to a point where I feel like totally exhausted. I now have a mentality that, well, this is great. It means that we're now at the starting point. It's about to start. <laughs> so, and it, it's a trick I use to push myself always beyond. And it, it's helped, you know, it's helped a long way. When I, in 2018, I go back to Penn, I uh, did my master's degree uh, in nonprofit leadership. And that same mindset, my professors were surprised, They're like, wait, Every student, the best students we've had in this program are people that have uh, gotten like a 3.9 GPA uh, with all A's. How are you able to get a 4.0, taking eight classes a semester and making A pluses in all of them? Like I said, well, I just, look, I just looked at the, the grades that are given out every semester and I saw that the professor said somebody can make an A plus. Okay, great. And then they go like, well, but the other students in your class didn't get that. I said, no, I am my own measurement. I'm my own standard. <laughs> I know what I'm capable, and I keep pushing myself. I, when I was studying hard, I, I'm always asking myself, what am I capable of? How much more could I go? Our generation needs that.
Think about it, you're at Monell. Think about all the scientists who are there. When they were coming up, they had it much more harder. They didn't have computers where they could look up things right now like we can. They had to go to libraries and read books. They had it much more harder. But look at what incredible careers they've been able to build. So really then you have to ask for our generation, what is our excuse? Because we are this generation that loves to give all the excuses. We give it all the time. So let's, you know, I always tell our staff members that if we have been able to see afar, then it's because you know, we stood on the shoulders of giants. There are a lot of people who have sacrificed for all of us to get to this far, our parents, our mentors, and then all of that. And let, keep in mind that we have it much more easier now. And so we should be able to do much more. Um, so that's the, the last piece I'll share with you. And you know, the final thing is, uh, the final thing I'll share with all of you is, um, you know, take the time to you know, build meaningful relationships. Why, is, why are relationships important? Relationships are found, uh, you know, what define you as a person. You can go for all the career and everything in life that you probably want, but then if you don't have core people in your life that you've taken the time to build meaningful relationships with, it's going to be a problem. You know, for instance, imagine I left Monol in 2012. Till this date, I still have a relationship with Paul, uh, Dr. Hakan, um, you know, Jen, and a lot of people. You best believe that if I'm in Philly, I'm definitely going to pass by. And so, and, and so that is something that you want to keep at the forefront of your mind, right? You never ever have to forget the people who have helped you to get to where you are today. If I had that, I'll probably take a picture and send it later. But in one of our classrooms, you know, there's, there's a picture of, there's a picture of, we have a picture of uh, Dr. Hakan there and the quote that he gave me. <laughs> and the quote that he gave me, because for me, that's like, you know, sort of my life defining quote. And, you know, he said that, Shadrach, you have to realize in real life, nobody's going to come and save you. The chariots are never coming. <laughs> if you have a problem, something you want to do, Go, go for the chariot, go and call it. Like there's nobody coming. And it's something I've kept at the back of my mind a lot. Really, really, if I find that there's a problem in the world, well, I'm not waiting for anybody to do it. I'm going to go fix it. And I find that when I want to fix it myself, people join on board to, you know, want to help me to be able to do that. And of course that also seeps into my personal life and, and then everything. So, you know, that's a little thing I'll share with all of you. Um, you know, stay, stay patient, you know, um, never, ever, ever, you know, this is cliche, never give up and then all of that. But I think the most important thing is be patient. If you want to do great things, really, really, really remarkable things, be patient. Because um, I can tell you patience will reward you a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I mean, I'm sitting here and, you know, two days when we're really patient with ourselves. And it's crazy because I always thought, wait, I'm behind. You know, my friends are going to med school, they're making money and all of that. I see how the tide turns. So patience is very, very uh, crucial. And then also be hard on yourself, really. You can do much more than you're capable of, much, much more. If that means eliminating unnecessary distraction, everything you need to do to give the world your 100%, we need it. Because another thing is at this age is where all the exciting ideas and everything come up. I promise you, if you leave this phase of your late teens, early to mid twenties, without really being uh, hard on yourself and trying to come up with something that can impact our world, outside of this phase, things get a little bit hard. Yes, you, you, can, you can still think. I'm still now able to think and come up with new topics, but not as when I was at, you know, at Penn, <laughs> when I was a college student. Um, had a lot of free time to be able to, you know, think through things and all of that. And the final thing is, you know, value relationships, take the time to build them, really invest time. Relationships, building them takes time. It means, you know, sending an email, like I do it all the time. Occasionally I'll send in an email to check in on Jen to see how they're doing, sometimes with Paul, sometimes with Dr. Hakan. I put it on my calendar, like you have to be intentional about it. Don't let this be the last time that, you know, you connect with your mentors. You trust me. 
It's not just the research thing. Sometimes when I have a personal issue, I go to Dr. Hakan. What would you have done? And you know, I go to him because he's also the, the person who will not sugarcoat it. I know that there may be some people in my life who will be like, well, Shadrach, you're being too hard on myself. Your, Dr. Hakan will be like, yes, that's good, but you have to do it this way, this way. <laughs> he's not going to, you know, give me a pat on the back. I don't need a pat on the back. I want the real thing to be able to do. So, and that helps and you have to invest into it. In fact, I will actually encourage you to find people in your life who tell you the truth that you don't want to hear. <laughs> so, because uh, that has helped me a lot. And, you know, that and then the baseline would just be, you know, focusing on uh, if, you, if, if you have some spirituality in your life, obviously encourage it. I find that in our generation, you know, we don't encourage spirituality a lot. But, and I certainly, as a Penn undergrad, I got to part of my life, you know, I, I didn't have any form of spirituality in my life. But now coming into the real world, I found that spirituality is something that can help you to be a bit more grounded, you know, have some more foundation. And in terms of chaos to chaotic times, be able to have some peace of mind. However spirituality means to you, if you can identify it and find some truth that, you know, you can anchor who you are on it. During difficult times, you'll be able to find peace when there is no peace. So thank you all of you for your time. Uh, I'm gonna hang around here, um, but yeah, I think I've gotten to the end of my speech, 30 minutes, actually three minutes past. Okay, <laughs> thanks. So Shadrach, um... <clears throat> Uh, let me, let, I, I, I feel like I want to talk for an hour, but we uh, can't, I'm actually going to let Hakan speak because I think he'll explode if I don't let him speak. But let me just say that it doesn't surprise me in the least that Yale would offer you a faculty position because I think I'll just say it like this. They quite simply see what all of us see right now. And it's not in the least surprising. Um, and I thank you so very much for being our friend and for all the work you're doing. You are changing the face. You are transforming society, which is the single most difficult thing on earth to do with our species. And you're doing it, and it's amazing. And with that, I'm going to let Hakan speak um, just a few brief comments. But I want to try to stay on schedule here. So Hakan, please uh, um, let us get back to student presentations. But with that, uh, I'll hand you over to... Dr. Hakan Ozdener. Thank you, Shadrach. Thank you very much, my dear. I've been thinking what I should say. I am very emotional. And the reason is that the, I don't think I did not deserve any of your good words towards me because you were humble, you were believing God, and uh, you did your best. But I want to say you that when I see you, when I listen to you, when I talk to you, I see myself, but you are younger than me. <laughs> when I was your age, you were like me, I was like you. I never look at the details. I never look at the surrounding negative things. I was looking for the future and not only the future, what I can give you the community around me, even younger age, but what you are doing is that what I was dreaming. I was not maybe successful, but you are very successful. And I am proud of you. And also please go to med school. Otherwise you cannot get higher than me. Remember, I have three degrees. You are still <laughs> working for the second one. If you want to get over me, you have to finish up the med school. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Keep in touch. I am proud of you. I am following you. Even behind, but I, am, I, I know what you are doing every step of your life. I am behind you. Thank you, Dr. Hakan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Hakan, and thank you so, so, so much, Shadrach. You're, uh, you're an awesome friend, and uh, we love you.